Welcome everybody to our um, monthly Lincoln Park Neighborhood Association meeting. I'm Jody Brooks and I'm the board president. And then Camus. I'm the secretary. No. And, uh, yes. I know, right? Come on, Stephen, say who you are. Oh, I'm Stephen. <laughs> I'm the vice president. And we're going to first try on the Lincoln Park board. Yeah. I don't have a title. Don't have a title. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to find you a title. <laughs> So we're glad that y'all are here today. So we have um, um, on our agenda today, Camus is going to talk to us about uh, the Board of Adjusters meeting that we had yesterday where we actually had a win uh, for um, our neighborhood. So she'll tell you about that. We have Cruz Shaw here, our, our soon to be tomorrow, I guess you're going to be sworn in. Thursday, oh, yeah. District 2 Councilman person. So that's going to come up in tomorrow. Tomorrow night for District 2. No, tomorrow or Thursday. Tomorrow, tomorrow night or something. Tomorrow right. evening, Arneson Theater, open to the public, 6, 6 o'clock, Bruce? Oh, come on. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm drinking water out of a fire hose right now. So yeah. I think it's 6 o'clock at the Arneson. It's right. definitely needs, I'll bring definitely needs the cheapest staff. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. <laughs> so he's going to come and introduce himself and talk to us a, a little bit. And then we have Eric Phillips uh, here for uh, the San Antonio Planning Department. He's going to talk about uh, the planning process. We're in the Midtown region. If you didn't know that, we are. It starts now. And it's starting up the planning process uh, for the San Antonio Comprehensive Plan. So that's starting up. In fact, it's starting next week at kickoff. So he's going to talk a little bit about that and then answer any questions that you might have. And then we have Tom Crystal here. That's from the Brackenridge uh, conservation and then he's going to discuss feral and abandoned cat issues that are affecting Brackenridge Park and surrounding neighborhoods. And Lynn Bob, the executive director. Yeah. And I said, she, here. Was, she was here, she was here last, last, last time. Last time. Yes. Yes. We were following it. Yes. She's here to make sure I stay between the lines. That's right. <laughs> it never <laughs> happened. <laughs> so now I'm going to turn it over to Candace. Okie dokie. Well, I wasn't really planning on talking, but Joni asked me to about 20 minutes ago. Maybe it was two hours ago. <laughs> anyway, so, but the point, the point, there's been a lot of, of um, traffic on the web page over the past couple of days uh, about things that are upcoming and wouldn't it be nice if somebody, somebody would go and, and tell those folks at the city how we need to have things happening in our neighborhoods. So I hope some of y'all have been you know, contributing to that traffic are here. You know, a couple of y'all are. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the process, how things go, and in, one, in particular the Board of Adjusters. Uh, so we were present for, actually there were two cases at the Board of Adjusters that were from Mankey Park. So there are a number of different boards. There's a zoning commission that um, uh, makes decisions about how a particular property is zoned, and then the Board of Adjusters makes decisions about whether or not to grant variances. Um, our NCD, our Neighborhood Conservation District. District, is posted on our website, so anyone can go there and look and see what are the requirements for buildings, for fences, for whatever. Um, there was an instance uh, just yesterday, day before yesterday, yesterday I think, yesterday. of someone who noticed a fence going up near their property and said, hey, I don't think this fence meets criteria for the, the Neighborhood Conservation District, and took it upon themselves, very, very thoughtfully and rightly so, to contact the city and say, hey, this, we don't think this meets. And, you know, and, and it did not, so we have a co-compliance officer, um, Mike, 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 Mike Udesti. Yeah, he's Mike in Udesti. charge of um, making sure that our NCD, he's with the city, he's in charge of making sure our NCD is being followed. So he goes and checks. Of course, he has to be alerted. Yeah, so anyone can alert him. Anyone can write in. Anyone can send to the city. This person wasn't quite sure where it went. Sent it to several places. It found its way there. Um, so <laughs> if you see anything going on that you don't think meets the criteria, that's what you do. You contact... Um, Michael Udeste, and in this case, you know, he put a stop work in, uh, and that person now can go and ask for a variance if they want to do that. Um, a similar thing that had happened, I guess, a couple of years ago in the house next to me, they put stucco up on it, which was not uh, for the NCD. Not for the NCD <laughs> over the brick, and, uh, and we, we got that stopped and they had to clean it off. 
So then if someone does want to do something that doesn't meet those criteria, they can go to the Board of Adjusters. There is, do any of you, however many of you live on the south side of, of Mankey Park? Uh, so on Bracken Ridge, has anyone seen that, that big empty space that's going on on Bracken Ridge? Okay, so PSW, uh, which is a construction company that's also building homes in Alamo Heights on Harrison, so right, right the street that goes into Central uh, Market, um, had purchased that property and they did the right thing. They came to the board and said, hey, we want to create um, a set of townhomes here and we have 33 and it's going to look like this and, and what do you all think? And I said, gee, we'd really like to see a plan. <laughs> so they came up with a plan, only the next time when the plan came it had 38. And then they said, well, by the way, we're going to try and buy that, that tail end of Brackenridge uh, and put some more up there. So then the plan became 45, um, two and three story uh, townhomes. Uh, when we looked at the plan, we saw some concerns with it. First off, those, those streets up there aren't narrow. Um, their comment was, well, it's all big monolithic apartments. And we said, that's one of the reasons, the one across the street from is one of the reasons why we don't want to let this go unchecked, because that happened. And second of which is, yeah, there are families who have children who might like to be out walking in the streets, and if we want to add you know, 45 times two or times one and a half more cars in that area, that's something to think about. The plan had saved a beautiful green space right in the center of it, but it had buildings that were against our requirements. Some of them were much longer than they were allowed to be, and there were, there were um, different things that were out of variance. So um, we worked with them as best as we could and they said, okay, we're gonna take this to the Board of Adjusters and request these variances. The first one was to decrease the distance behind the buildings to the property line, which in that case backed up with Fort Sam. Well, if Fort Sam doesn't care, we don't care. So we're not gonna oppose that one. The second one, we have um, a, ruling that's, a rule that says that the parking has to be behind the facade and they were having parking garages underneath so that they would be in front of the facade. We chose not to oppose that one because they were in the buildings in the rear, it would not be visible from the street, so we were not so concerned about that. The, um, the next one, though, was that the buildings would be, the buildings in the rear would be 120 feet long. Our NCD says they can be 80 feet long, so that was 50% greater than they could be. Uh, and also that instead of the required 20 feet in between buildings that are more than, than uh, four units long, uh, there's a requirement for 20 feet between them, they wanted to reduce that to 11 feet. So if you can kind of imagine, you know, 420 foot buildings with 11 feet behind them, that's kind of canyonizing and monolithic. Those were at the back of the property, the ones at the front, they were going to be 62 feet long uh, and would have uh, I think it was 10 feet in between them. So again, we kind of felt that and two stories tall, so we thought that would kind of look a little monolithic. So we went and spoke with the Board of Adjusters. Uh, we have a land use committee that helps us, that looks at um, uh, propositions like this and helps us decide what to do. So uh, Daniel Lazarine and, and Isabel Garcia were two architects who were on the committee and who both gave us some really thoughtful input as did um, some past board members and, and past members on that committee. Um, so Isabel Garcia and I went to the Board of Adjusters meeting yesterday. What you do is you, anyone can go down there, anyone can speak, you go to the one-stop shop, which is in 1901 South Alamo, you sign in, you say, I'm here to speak on this cause, they have an agenda out there so you can see the number and put your name in there, and you get three minutes. Of course, by the time hours rolled around, it was an hour and a half in. The meetings always start at one o'clock. They start promptly and they run pretty well, but there's a lot of cases. I think ours was six. Um, so it was probably about two by the time that came up. So the, the developer gets to present what they want to do. Uh, and then anyone who's there uh, gets their three minutes to speak. So uh, Isabel Garcia and I were there to speak and we, we said kind of those things that we thought it looked monolithic. Um, she said that it canyonized the, the streets there with the big three-story ones on the other side, too. Uh, and then they vote. 
you have to have nine votes to, to prevail. The developer has to have nine votes to, to uh, get the variance, which I had not realized. I thought it was a 50-50. So um, they got the ones that we did not oppose, and then the ones that we opposed, we prevailed uh, by a 7-4 and an 8-3 vote. So that was a positive outcome. They cannot build those buildings that close together. They cannot build them that length. Um, we did not get an opportunity to talk with Mr. Corbell before he left because he kind of shot off <laughs> to go <laughs> talk to his that. folks like a rocket, <laughs> I think. And it didn't turn out the way that he wanted, but the point of it all was he came to talk to us, which we, we did, you know, we did tell them that, that he was present, he spoke to us, we just couldn't agree on this, these two things, and that was why I was there at the Board of Adjusters. So now they can either change it, work with the NCD, use the NCD requirements as, as upheld by the Board of Adjusters, or they can do something else. And that's really important. So I think the reason why Joni wanted me to tell you all about that is, you know, I mean, I, I live here. Uh, I don't live on that end of town, but I don't want to see, I've been watching those apartments go up and I didn't want to see any more. Any of y'all can go and speak and say your reasons why. I mean, the reasons I spoke about were more neighborhood. This was very inwardly oriented around a green space, so those people wouldn't have a whole lot of reason to, to come and be a part of our neighborhood. Uh, not to mention that, you know, that I was out of concerns about uh, people being able to age in place here in this neighborhood. Everyone's property values are going up so rapidly. Kids being able to be safe walking to school and et cetera. So we put those things there, and that's what the Board of Adjusters decided. Mm -hmm. So anyone can do it. I would encourage you to. And those, those uh, they're posted online. They're, they send us an email telling us what's coming up. Um, yeah, and the, and the main thing, too, is that, you know, we, we all have to have eyes out there in our neighborhood. And even if you think 1%, 2% that something may be against the NCD, contact the board, and we can tell you who to contact, because we can't be out there seeing. So more and more, and then with Garrett coming, coming up in a little bit to talk to us about planning, you know, we, we're in a hotbed of developers. Crown sure. Zero. Yeah, yeah, wanting to come Thanks in so and scoop up and build and density. We're talking about density. And and we do have an NCD. Is it historic? No, it's not historic. But we do have some standards. And so it's really up to all of us to have our eyes out and then report it so that we can uh, keep our neighborhood, um, which reason that we all live here, right? Because we love this neighborhood. But thank you for going, Camus, and taking three hours of her day. Yeah, so, so, um, so let's have uh, Mr. Shaw come on. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Wade Shaw, but people call me Cruz. Where does Cruz come from? Okay, I'll tell you. My mom's maiden name is Cruz. My mom raised me, so it's, it's pretty much my, I tried to take my last name when I was a kid, but she wouldn't let me, so she's called Cruz. She called him a different name, but when I can talk about <laughs> But um, they, I, I, we were just elected as the new the council for District 2, so we swear in uh, tomorrow. And uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was a hard journey, but um, it, it was worth the effort. Um, one thing that I want to make sure that we do as a district is bring the district back together again. Because right now, the district is very big. We can probably fit Washington, D.C. inside District 2. Um, and we have probably, I would argue, the biggest or the most diverse district in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, economic, social, economic, ethnic. Um, it's just we have a very diverse district. So I want to make sure we bring our district back together on the issues that we all have. Um, I, I, I was a chairman of zoning, so I understand the, the procedure of zoning very well. And I want everyone here to understand the procedure. So I'm glad that planning is here today because it's a very, it can be a very complicated tool if you don't know how to read the language. But once you know how to read the language, it's very simple. And we need people involved. Our staff is going to come to you all for assistance. I'm, I, we're here to work for you all. And I brought some staff members. I want them to introduce themselves to you as well. But at the end of the day, you're our bosses. And so we need to hear from you. Um, we're going to have a 48-hour turnaround time. Right. All right, cool. All right. Uh, did you write that down? Yeah, 48 hours. If we get a call or an email, we'll return that call or email within 48 hours. We may tell you, we have to look into your question, but we
but we're going to acknowledge the fact that we're receiving through your email or your phone call. It's, that's really huge. I practice law for a living, and that's an ethic violation for those who, know, if I don't return a phone call. So that's just the way I run my office. I plan to run city councils at, um, the same way. I'm really excited. I'm really excited. I'm extremely tired because we won when last Saturday. <laughs> when? I don't even know. We have 10 days to get ready. So I'm, I'm hiring attorneys from, from my law office, getting our, my staff together, getting our office together, paperwork, meetings, 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 more meetings. So everything is kind of happening very quickly. But at the end of the day, I'm, we're here to serve. We're, we're, we're here to serve. I want to bring up uh, Ms. Barry. She's going to be my chief of staff. Um, I'll give her a few minutes just so y'all know uh, who she is when y'all see her in the district. <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brencia. Uh, like Councilman Shaw said, we are here to help you all. Uh, so please feel free to come talk to me uh, as you see me. Uh, give me your contact information and we'll be sure to follow up on any issues that you may have. And uh, I also wanted to let you all know, of course, the inauguration is tomorrow. It's at 6.30 at Arneson on the river. So please come and celebrate with us, celebrate our new councilmen. And um, yeah, just come say hi, and we will work with this together. Thanks. 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 And then we have Jarvis Swallow. Jarvis Swallow has been in the district for quite some time. Um, he's worked with uh, Councilwoman Sheila McNeil as well as, as, well as uh, Council, Councilperson Ivy Taylor. So he'll be our Director of Constituent Services. So he's going to be out there in the field working, talking to folks, getting, you know, what's going on in our communities. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, <laughs> um, I guess, um, like I said, my name is Jarvis Swallow. Uh, um, Councilman kind of, um, my past experience, just most recently I just came from the state. I worked for TYC, uh, Juvenile Justice. But prior to that, I was a council aide for, uh, I was over constituent services for Councilwoman Taylor when she was in the council person for District 2, and she looked me out during her two terms as well. So, uh, what's called the councilman was uh, able to talk me into coming back, coming back to the district. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've, been, I've been working in the district since 99, so it, it's, you know, it's really second nature. And, you know, just like, you know, we're just here to serve, you know, serving with, you know, um, you know, juvenile offenders for the last five years, so I'm kind of coming back, you know, doing some community work. But thank you guys. Thank you. So, so, like I said, we're still working on phones, emails, all that stuff. Once we get that, we'll get the information to you so you'll have it. Um, we'll office hours, all that kind of good stuff. Right now, like I said, it's very chaotic. Mm -hmm. you know, hopefully, this will settle down, you know, Monday or Tuesday, but we're here to, we're here to serve. That's our main purpose. We're here to serve. Any questions or anything, that's what we're here to answer. All right? All right, so now we have uh, Garrett Phillips from the Planning Department of the City. So he's going to tell us about the master plan and what's going to be happening. Hi everybody, thanks for having me. My name is Garrett Phillips and I work for the City of San Antonio Planning Department, um, otherwise known as the Department of Planning and Community Development you like more words. Um, we are the department that has worked with neighborhoods over the last couple of decades to create neighborhood plans. Um, Mankey Park uh, updated theirs last, I think, in around 2001, 2003. Um, and many other neighborhoods got to participate in that program um, where people would come together, um, articulate their vision for the future, what kind of development should happen. Um, and the planning department helped put, put that into a plan. Um, more recently, in the last couple of years, we worked on uh, the SA Tomorrow Comprehensive Plan, which was a, a bigger picture look at the entire city of San Antonio, um, thinking about how we can um, take advantage of and grow in the right way, considering that families are growing and people are moving here um, to the tune of uh, over a million people over the next uh, 25 years or so when you combine those two things. Um, so that being a reality, how do we respond to that as a city, um, as a whole? Um, and so that plan was finished last year. Uh, thousands of people uh, participated and gave us ideas. Um, and the plan is now online, and you can look at it. It's called the SA Tomorrow Comprehensive Plan. Um, one of the outcomes of that plan was that it said now the planning department is supposed to go out and make more detailed plans uh, for smaller areas of the city again because 
we couldn't get into all the detail uh, that, that we needed to looking at the whole city. Um, it's just too big, over 500 square miles. Um, so it's essentially say, um, go back and with several neighborhoods at a time, think about some more detailed ideas for the future. Um, because now it's been a couple decades, uh, in many cases, since a neighborhood has done a neighborhood plan. Many neighborhoods never even got to participate in that program and don't even have a plan. Um, so the idea now is that we're working with several neighborhoods at a time to make new plans. And Mankey Park is one of the neighborhoods that I'm going to be working with throughout this year to make a new plan. Mankey Park, West Fort Alliance, a small part of Government Hill near Broadway, um, Tobin Hill Community, uh, Five Points, and a small neighborhood near Fred Road. Uh, all together, uh, we're going to work on a new plan for the future. Um, and it will take about a year to complete. Um, there's going to be technical analysis. I'm, can I finish? And, and we will definitely do some questions afterwards. Um, there's going to be technical analysis. There's going to be uh, public participation, uh, different kinds of public participation for different kinds of people that want to participate in different ways. Not everybody likes a meeting. Um, not everybody uses web pages. We need to have diverse ways of doing that kind of thing. Um, so um, we're about to start. We haven't started yet. Um, over the last couple of months, I've been out speaking with many people in the community, um, just starting to get to know the area myself in a preliminary sort of fashion. Um, we're going to have an advisory team that we're calling a planning team. And it's going to have somebody from each neighborhood association board um, and somebody from one of several uh, uh, stakeholder organizations like um, San Antonio College, for example, um, and Methodist Hospital. They're a large employer over at Tobin Hill. Um, so that team is going to meet several times throughout the next year to advise us on how we're doing with the plan. So after doing a bunch of public participation, analysis, and planning team meetings, we will bring a plan to the Planning Commission and ultimately City Council asking for their approval, at which point it would become uh, the new official plan for this area. Um, the plan that you've already created, albeit somewhat older, uh, has a lot of useful information probably. And we're going to ask you to tell us how useful it is and what in there is useful. Um, and what you think is, is still really good information for us to be thinking about. Um, we don't want to reinvent the wheel on that front. Um, the plan, I'll tell you what's going to be inside of it. There'll be a land use plan. So it'll be a map uh, with different colors categorizing what kinds of uses uh, and development should happen in the future. It's a precursor to zoning, less specific than zoning. Um, but zoning ultimately does get based on the land use map. Um, we're going to have a transportation and mobility section where we try to uh, prioritize the highest priority projects uh, for the next uh, 10 years or so. Um, we're going to have a housing strategy, an economic development strategy, a parks <coughs> open space section, um, and we're going to have a section on catalytic development sites. So those are the topics. It's a lot. Um, it's still going to be somewhat broad. Um, we're not going to be talking about every detail of every project. We're thinking comprehensively about all these things together um, for a pretty big area. So um, pretty soon we're going to have a web page posted um, where you can find uh, information specific to this plan that we're going to work on together, uh, including dates of meetings that we're going to have and other online participation opportunities. Um, right now, you can go to satomorrow.com uh, to look at the citywide comprehensive plan and get a sense for why we're doing this and how this came to be. Um, and uh, you're welcome to contact me, uh, any, any of you, anytime throughout the coming year. Uh, my business cards are in the back, and I will be back to more neighborhood association meetings. Um, I put a sign-in sheet on the back table, I'm sorry to have to ask you to do this twice, but if you would like to leave your email on it, um, 
It's light blue. It has some light blue and orange colors on it. If you want to key in on that on your way out, you can leave your email and you'll be added to a list where we will send you an email anytime there's an event happening, a uh, public meeting, um, or some kind of online uh, engagement opportunity. Um, and you, you get occasional updates on the progress that we're making, if a, a draft document you know, is coming out or something like that. Um, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, I'm sure I forgot some important things, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you have for now. Yes, thanks for waiting. What standing will our current plan have after this process? When this process is complete and the Midtown Regional Center Master Plan is adopted in about a year, um, it will replace the existing neighborhood plans. Um, and so that, in that way, we want to make sure that we capture the things that are useful and still valid you know, after 15 years and incorporate that into the new plan. Uh, but this plan will be the new official um, city land use plan and priorities document for this area and other neighborhoods. So basically there will be no neighborhood plans, there will be large area plans. There will be larger area plans, yes. Which will dilute the desires of the individual neighborhoods. Well, we think that we can have a process that addresses the neighborhood's concerns and issues and that essentially um, takes into account bigger picture issues as well, um, bigger picture opportunities, um, and brings them together into one document. Um, so I understand uh, your concern and we have heard it from other people. Um, and yeah, theoretically a larger plan means less attention for one, one neighborhood. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's important to keep in mind that not every neighborhood even got to make those plans because it was, it was really hard to keep up. Chris, did you have something you wanted to add? Chris is uh, my colleague and supervisor from the planning department. Yeah, I was just going to add, partly to address your concern, um, it's one of the reasons we wanted to make sure that we had a neighborhood representative uh, from each of the affected neighborhoods on each of our sub-area plans. Um, but more specifically, we are going to have a section in the plan that basically, and we're coming up with exactly the right term, but it'll be something along the line of neighborhood action strategies or something like that, where it will be a couple pages specifically devoted to Mankey Park, where you all say, these are the things that are most important to us in Mankey Park, the things that we really want to prioritize. We'll do that for the other neighborhoods that uh, Garrett mentioned. And then hopefully there's at least some synergy between those that we're going to kind of elevate at least some of those to be priorities or key investments for the entire Midtown area. So um, although the plan does replace the individual neighborhood plans so that we can do this more efficiently in the future, there will definitely be recognition of and uh, acknowledgement of the priorities that are really crucial to each neighborhood. And from what I understand and have been told from Ruby, you know, and all of our discussions, our NCD will still be intact. Yes, this is not going to affect overlay districts. Um, as Garrett said, the, one of the key aspects of it is to do the future land use map, which will eventually drive potential zoning changes. So in certain parts of the city, one of the big frustrations over the last number of years has been that land use plans were put in place, but and as I'm sure you saw, a lot of times zoning wasn't updated to kind of match that and align mm -hmm. to that. So as a department and working with um, development services, uh, following the year or two after we do each of these plans throughout the whole city, we'll try to go back through and either update uh, the UDC to reflect these things or update specific zoning codes to reflect this so that as you all move forward in the future, you have your NDC and you have zoning that's updated to reflect the future land use for the new town. So that's where it can get a little bit more personal. Through our, that's where it can get a little bit more personal through our NCD. We actually have a CCO. Our NCD isn't enforced now. It, we're enforcing it. We're we are just enforced it yesterday. We enforced it at the board. We're doing our best to try to enforce it. We are it. doing our best, but the city does not enforce the NCD. If it did, there would not be garages on the premises of all of those. those. That's a gap in our NCD. It's a gap, and that's a gap that we're looking at filling. We have a CCRF that I need to talk to Mr. Cruz about. About filling that gap, but 
Well, it's going to be critical for all the neighbors to be actively involved yeah. in the yeah. planning process to the greatest extent we can be. Yeah, it's very important. We, we've taken them, Fran, we've taken that whole issue with the city. It's a gap in our NC, in our NCD. I know that the Tier 1 group has been working really hard, but I also know that the NCD is primarily ignored by city staff. If, if city staff took the NCD as a primary document to use, these plans would never get as far as they do. There wouldn't be Board of Adjustment hearings because they just wouldn't get that far. There would not be parking pads suddenly appearing. Yeah. And that's, so, that's true, and that's why we have to be the enforcers. You know, we have to be the ones. But it's also uh, part of the Tier 1 Coalition uh, agenda to get staff specific tasks mm -hmm. you know, to be working with neighborhoods uh, on the NCDs or other issues. Because you're right, they don't have the staff to monitor what's going on in all the neighborhoods across the city. And staff who are not part of development That's right, services. so we have to actually have, we would like to see the city have staff specifically a task to work with the, the neighborhoods. So hopefully, the new regime in the city hall, maybe we'll get that. <laughs> yeah. so. mm -hmm. Other questions about the Midtown Master Plan? I, I would like to, I have a concern. I mean, we already, just as this neighborhood took us a year to make this one plan because we too are a very diverse neighborhood. We have various areas uh, that have different needs and have different interests. What I'm now hearing is you're throwing not just this one, but just one diverse area, you're throwing several others together, and then you have one delegate per that area that's already diverse in itself to help you to create this huge document that replaces everything else, that's a concern. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, it's, it's, it is a big task for us to bring um, multiple diverse neighborhoods together that really do have a lot of differences, even within their own boundaries, um, and, um, and, and achieve some consensus and a common vision for the future. It's, it's not a small task. Um, and. You know, we are asking one representative from each neighborhood association board to be on the planning team, but like I said, we're also doing a lot of other public outreach, um, not only to people that are, you know, that come to neighborhood association meetings and people on the neighborhood association board, but we're going to try to find people that don't participate with the neighborhood association. Such as, and really, aside from San Antonio College, what other kinds of entities will be on the plan? The um, so, I, I heard two questions. We'll actually ask for your help to identify people, maybe that don't aren't part of the neighborhood association that we should try to find and reach out to, and I maybe even ideas for how to do that. Other people who are going to be on the planning team um, until they finally confirm it's not final. But uh, San Antonio College, uh, we've asked Methodist Hospital. Um, University of the Incarnate Word, um, yeah, a couple of developers, um, Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, um, a small business owner on St. Mary's, a small business owner on Fred Road. Is it team team in the middle? No. no. We haven't asked them. What about any of the museums? We've asked the Whitty Museum and Brackenridge Park Conservancy. Um, and unfortunately, it leaves out all kinds of people that we need to be talking to. Um, we we want to have a group that's small enough that we can have some really productive and detailed conversations. Um, and to do that, not everybody can be on that team. Um, that leaves a lot of people that we have to go out and speak with in interviews and phone calls and focus groups and make sure that we're communicating with them anyway. There's I'm concerned about the one person and how that one person is chosen. Is this going to be one of those things behind closed doors that nobody knows how that one person is chosen? And, you know, it seems to me that if there's one person chosen, that there needs to be a lot of transparency about that choosing process. I'm concerned because I see in my neighborhood that things pop up 
that don't have transparency where we understand how the choosing process happens. Can I, can I jump in on that? The same point would be about that planning team, mm -hmm. the advisory team. That needs to be transparent. The, the, the operation of that team yeah. needs to I be transparent. I just think we need to know how these things are selected and that it's not just three or four people who say that would be a good person, that's the person we want. It feels like sometimes things get ramrodded a little bit in this neighborhood. So the SHRO comprehensive plan, um, of course, in the over 300 pages that it has, found some space to identify who's supposed to be on the planning team in some categories. Uh, it did say that um, somebody from each neighborhood association uh, is supposed to be on the planning team. Um, and we're leaving it to each neighborhood association board to decide uh, who's, who that's going to be. Um, when it comes to other people on the planning team, um, the, it's in chapter 17. There's a few different categories of the kinds of organizations, large employers uh, and the like. Um, who, um, or you know, large educational institutions that you know have some influence over the future um, and have plans already that we need to be aware of and thinking about how all of this stuff fits together. Um, so that's essentially how it's chosen. The planning team meetings, um, you know, we're hoping that your representative from the neighborhood can do some reporting back to you. I'm also available to come and speak with you on a regular basis, essentially, to update you on how the planning <coughs> process is going. Um, as much as you ask me to be here, I can be here. Um, the only way that wouldn't work out is if another neighborhood meets on the exact same night, I would have to find some balance, for example, mm -hmm. if they're asking me to come to all of their meetings, too. Um, so, Gary, can I address a little bit yeah. your concern? So this is all new to us and then how we're going to do, do this. But if, if anyone is wanting to be considered to be part of the, of the planning team, you know, email us. Because um, though we're, we're going to have one person that's going to be a representative, that one person can't do it all. And we're all like, who's that one person going to be? Because that's a full, you know, almost like a full-time job. So, um, you know, we're looking at how can we orchestrate this. You know, there's going to have to be people behind that person that are going to take some of the load from that person to do the communicating out because one person can't do it all. So, you know, please contact us and then, you know, we'll be as transparent as we know. And also, if you want to be involved in helping choosing who that person is, you know, contact us at the info, at the, uh, at the info email. Can that go into the newsletter? Can what go into the newsletter? Uh, just that. That sign, that last thing you said, if anybody is interested in it's been in the figuring out how that person will be able to identify okay. in this contact, sure. yeah. in a contact point. And we've, we put into the newsletter before about all of this coming, coming down, and about needing the people to participate. So we have done that and asked people to contact us, because um, it is going to be a big job. I want to thank Tier 1 for ensuring that there will be neighborhood representatives. I understand that y'all have a lot to do with placing neighborhood representatives on the, uh, on the committee. And I really appreciate the work that y'all have done. No, thank you. Mm -hmm. And you also mentioned that there are going to be like more broad public update meetings. How often do you guys plan to do those? Um, I think we're going to have uh, three to four open house uh, workshop type meetings um, and look for the first one um, probably in August. Uh, but keep an eye out in general for our webpage. Please, in, in a few weeks, look out for it and um, please add your name to the email list. Um, if you follow us on um, Twitter or Instagram or um, I think we're going to be doing Facebook. Uh, and next door. These are also ways that we're going to be announcing meetings as what's well. Your, what are y'all, what's the handle for the Twitter? I say to I actually don't know exactly, but I should. Are you on the spot? <laughs> I think I it should just be SA Tomorrow. I think it's SA Tomorrow 2040. Okay. SA Tomorrow 2040? Okay. Yeah.
So please be involved. I look forward to hopefully seeing every one of you again, maybe multiple times in the coming year. It, it is important to uh, participate and be aware and, and contribute to the plan. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. tonight about a lot of our neighbors just to the west here. Uh, Tom Crystal has had a long business history with food brokerage companies and he has also had a long history with helping uh, the, the uh, society in a number of ways. He's been on the board of directors of America's Second Harvest. He's been chairman of the San Antonio Regional Food Bank. He's active with United Way of San Antonio. He's a board member of the Brackenridge Park Conservancy and is now uh, an officer uh, of the Conservancy. But to, to tonight's point, in 2011, he founded, was one of the organizers of, the Brackenridge Park Community Cats Project. Uh, if you don't know it, there is a long and unfortunate history of Brackenridge Park being a dumping ground for unwanted pets. And what Tom and a number of other volunteers have done is help to make those pets have a reasonable life in Brackenridge Park and when it can be done, finding them homes outside the park. The Crystals have six cats. Uh, five of which came from Brackenridge Park. I have three cats, all of which came from Brackenridge Park and wandered into my yard uh, a couple years ago. And so I'd like to turn the floor over to uh, San Antonio's uh, premier cat lady. Tom cat Christmas. lady. <laughs> well, in fact, I've listened to all the discussion about planning and we just went through the Brackenridge Park master planning process. And that brought back some kind of interesting memories, and we're not done. It's an endless, endless uh, lifetime of planning, it seems, once you get involved in these kind of circumstances. And, and we too have met with Garrett as well, and uh, you know, we're all in this together. Yeah, you're our neighbors. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and indeed, and I have a home in Carmel by the Sea, California, which there is no more contentious real estate or issues with, as you just described, than our lots are all standard 40 by 100 feet and everybody fights over everything and we're becoming more like california and hopefully someday california is going to become a little bit more like us so at that let's talk a little bit about uh, the cats the brackenridge park uh, actually it's the conservancy's community cat project and i'm just one in a long line of people that have been involved in this so it's been this has been a generational thing cats have been in this park forever as you'll uh, as you'll learn as i kind of work through this um, So we operate under uh, um, with a memorandum of understanding between the city, uh, Animal Care Services, uh, San Antonio Parks Department, and the Conservancy has been our home. It's the Conservancy that really gave us a, a standing to deal with all the entities that are involved in the park. Our goal really is, is, to, is to take care of the situation. Unfortunately, we're pioneering here. There's not another park in the United States an urban park, a major urban central park like ours that has the kind of animal abandonment problem that San Antonio does. The closest place you can go to to find a situation like ours is in Maui, and then and there's a couple of places in Seattle that are somewhat similar. So we're, we're pioneering here. So when I say our goal is to build the best practice, other people are watching what we're doing. You know, so just so we're all on the same terms, you know, what's a community cat? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a cat without license. It's a cat without a home. Uh, an ear tip is a good thing. When you see a cat that has its ear tip, that means it's, in, it's not intact. It's not going to reproduce. It's kind of falls secondary down to our list of concerns. They're free roaming. Uh, in the case of Brackenridge Park, uh, primarily they have been abandoned in that park. Why am I involved? You're right, I'm a business guy. I mean, we, you know, long story about that, but uh, I just couldn't stand the fact that people abandon animals in Brackenridge Park. It just, it just makes me very angry. And, and somebody had to raise their hands to do it. Howard Peake introduced me to the situation. 
Leela Powell, who's our prior executive director before Lynn Bobbitt, who's with us tonight, um, kept me involved and got me involved. And, and uh, it's just a, it's a passionate thing for me. Uh, I mentioned master planning. Brackridge Park has gone through a master plan, as some of you all very well know. In that master plan, one of the first things we did was a biodiversity study. In that biodiversity study, of course, the first, one of the first things they found were that there was, you know, there weren't enough small mammals, there weren't enough frogs and lizards, and you know, whatever. What happened? Well, there were a lot of cats there, more then when they did the study than there are now. And so the plan pointed out that you know, invasive animal species are a problem. You've got to reduce the feral cat densities, move uh, the feeding stations away from wildlife basically just reduce the number of cats uh, and positively affect the situation which remains difficult. In my business career, which spanned a lot of time in a lot of companies and, and you know, large companies, I really haven't run into a problem any more complex than this. This, this is a toughie. All the way back to 2009 when the Conservancy, the Brackridge Park Conservancy was first founded, uh, so their organizing concerns right up front were feral cats. Uh, the, the, like I said, the cat situation has been top of mind with a lot of people in the park uh, or in the neighborhoods for a long time. Your neighborhood, for example. Uh, you mentioned, the gentleman mentioned the 2001 Mackey Park plan. Well, in that plan, uh, one of the, you know, under safety and one of the first, the first objective under safety was animal care. You know, what are you going to do to get stray animals off the street? And uh, further along, of course, and we're thankful for this, is Support Rackers Park is a major amenity to your neighborhood. So we're, we're partners in this, and I think, as Paul mentioned when I walked in, he sees cats that go back and forth, and certainly I'm sure there are those that do, although it's kind of hard to uh, put a number on that. What we did put a number on was uh, working with animal care services. You know, if you can't measure it, you can't approve it. And I went into this as a business guy trying to figure out, you know, what are we going to do? How big is the problem? Are we unique or what? So ACS shared all their data with me for calls. You, can't, you cannot count cats, uh, not in a large area. It's just not possible. It's not scientifically possible. So what we did is we, we got all the calls into 311 that concerned cats. They gave us this information. You figure that if there's a call, then there's probably a number of cats nearby. And we plotted that on a heat map. And uh, where we're that circle right there is basically the neighborhood, Nike Park, Brackridge Park, River Road, Tobin Hill, etc. And you can see that the red spots are high, high density of calls, the highest density of calls. Can you see that? All right, you want to turn off one of those lights, Cruz, maybe the first one or somebody? Yeah, maybe that would help a little bit. It's not a real easy chart to see. Um, so that was citywide, and then when you narrow it down to the neighborhood, uh, Brackner's Park itself is not problematic in terms of public concern about the cats. Uh, no one really calls. The only calls that really showed up in Brackner's Park were from pet shops and the Paul Jolly Center where if someone was looking to adopt an animal and they were bitten or scratched, that has to be reported by law. Um, then there's the occasional cat that's you know, hit, injured, whatever it calls in. But the park itself has not really seen a, a see the cats as a, as a major safety concern. But if you look at your neighborhood over here, Mackey Park, uh, you know, it's a high density deal. And this goes back to, two, this is when ACS first started this in 2011 to 2015 is when I did this. So it's problematic, you know, there are a lot of cats in this part of the world and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate for the cats as well. So our goal is to reduce the number of free roaming cats in Brackenridge Park. Now, when I first got involved, I thought, well, in fact, this can't be too hard. We'll get it down to zero, and I'll go play God. But it doesn't work that way. It's now, I understand, it's down to the minimum number possible, and no one really knows what the minimum number is. We have help in this. A guy named uh, Dr. John Boone is a PhD from Washington, George Washington University. We engaged to help us understand this. He is the preeminent expert on free roaming uh, uh, pets in the world. It goes all over Turkey, London, I mean, Maui, you know, wherever there's a problem, he's there. And he basically said, Tom, you're always going to have cats in Brackenridge Park, no matter what you do, which I found unfortunate, but anyway, I guess he knows. So what do we do? Well, we humanely care for the population that's there on 365 days a year. Uh, 
you know, no matter what the weather is or anything else, Christmas, Easter, we're there taking care of those cats. We provide uh, wet and dry food for them. We, uh, the volunteers that we have, have to bring in their water. The cats really need water. Oftentimes, when I go in to feed, and I still feed once a week, uh, you put the food out, the cats are thirsty. They're going to go to the water. Not all of them near, or, uh, live near the river. So it's a, it's a challenge. And importantly, our, our volunteers observe uh, and they record and report. Because if we have an injured cat, uh, a sick cat, uh, they watch those cats over time. And I'll show you one at the end here what, what happens. Uh, and new cats, new cats that are, that, that are not ear tipped. It's an all-point bulletin, we gotta go get that cat because the last thing we want is to have a bunch of kittens born in Brackridge Park. There hadn't been a litter of kittens born in Brackridge Park in two years that we know about, so that's pretty good. Um, feral cats, you know, uh, not, um, cats that are just not social are trapped and they're fixed and they're returned. There's nowhere else for them to go in this city. Uh, you know, a sanctuary someplace else, like wildlife rescue, might be something that could happen down the road, but it didn't happen now. Uh, so they go back to the park. Actually, that doesn't happen very often. Uh, social cats and kittens, unfortunately, kittens are a big part of the deal. Last year, we uh, rescued 52 kittens from Brackenridge Park. Had they been born, had we not been there to take care of them, remove them, had they grown up there, and, and you probably wouldn't be able to catch them all. But, you know, Brackenridge Park would soon become uh, an attraction just to go see the cats, like some island in Japan. Um, <laughs> So, fortunately, we've been able to, to remove those cats for adoption. We have to work like hell to, to, uh, to uh, find homes for them. The Humane Society has been very helpful. Animal Care Services has their own share of issues. Uh, Cruz, you'll learn a lot about all that as time unfolds, but it's a, it's a problem. And uh, resident cats, you know, then we have cats that have been there all their lives. Some, some of those cats were born there, you know, many years ago before we were really active. And uh, they're social, they, they are sort of social, they understand people, you can pet them. I've tried to take some home, but they're not happy. They don't want to be in a home. The park is their home. So those cats are left there to, to live out their lives, which is only about eight years. So the attrition rate is actually pretty high for cats in the park. All of our efforts are volunteer. We have about 20 people that volunteer to help us. We're always looking for volunteers, one handed that out. Um, Basically, you show up, uh, you know, I'll tell you how we divide it up. And, uh, bring your food in, bring your water in, clean the area up, check the cats out, and away you go. They're always greeting you. They're certainly happy to see you whenever you arrive. Uh, we have 12 active managed colonies in the park, and these, these locations have been there forever. I mean, why, I don't know. But, you know, this is where people fed the cats and where they, uh, kind of consolidated. So we have, we've broken up into the main park and the tea gardens and also the Augie's Barbecue Place, which is, is uh, the hotbed for abandonment, unfortunately. So the tea gardens and Augie's are the, together are 48 cats, that's the highest number. And then Avenue A, uh, which has actually seen a decrease over the years, as you'll see. So that's how we break it up. And then we have teams, we have three teams of volunteers. So there are volunteers in the main park, tea gardens, and then people that just take care of Avenue A. To tell you how bad the problem was, I mean, again, I go back to, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't approve it. Uh, there were records that, that were first uh, kept in 2000, starting in 2005 to 2009, when the situation was so bad that uh, the Parks Department started to kill the cats. Well, that, <coughs> that got everybody's attention, and uh, they changed their tune, uh, decided that the best way to, this is when trap new return first started to come on the scene. So there was a mass trap. Uh, people, volunteers went in uh, together with uh, uh, ACS and, the, and veterinary groups and they trapped a total of 370 unfixed cats during that period of time. Now, the animal shelter, y'all, how many, most of y'all know that the pound, our animal shelter, was in the park for 62 years. That's the reason that Brackridge Park is considered a sanctuary. That's the source. The, the, the stock for all these cats that are there. People would abandon them there overnight uh, when the facility was closed, just leave them on the front steps. Uh, the cats would go off into the park, kittens, the whole thing. And then there are caretakers. You know, the average lifespan of an animal going to that old pound was 45 minutes. They took two tons of carcasses a day out of that 
out of that pound. It was the deadliest pound in, the, in North America, for sure. Uh, but that went away in 2008. Unfortunately, they put Paul Jolly back, which further uh, just solidifies the park as a sanctuary, and people are banning animals there. So, and they find their way to the park. Uh, so the tea garden's always been up at the 184 number. You know, that's you know, the highest number, 119 in the main park, 27 on that today. And Broadway still is a, you know, that's Mission Creek for me to go worry about cats on the other side of your neighborhood. I mean, I, I want to get together with ACS and find a way to work with them to uh, help deal with this problem. So here's what we've done since I've gotten involved. Uh, Back in 2010, we had 181 total cats in the park. Today we have 96. Unfortunately, there's a slight uptick there. For the first time since I've been involved, we couldn't keep up with abandonment. Uh, and primarily, as you see in the main park, we had a little uptick there with the tea garden. And uh, in that area over there behind the barbecue area, is, is people just drive up, throw the cats out, and leave. It's an easy deal. And there's no enforcement. Uh, we beg uh, Parks Department to help us, and, and uh, the Park Police. And you know, the first time I met with the Park Policeman, the head guy, great guy, sweet as he could be, uh, listened intently. And he said, "Tom," and he said, "I thought the park was a sanctuary for cats." And uh, it's just, it's just the the way this has been ingrained in our culture in San Antonio. So we've done a good job, and I'm concerned about the fact that we, we aren't able to keep up with it. Uh, Talk about master planning. Uh, one of the things I worked hard on was to get this into the Brackenridge Park master plan. It is uh, basically. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can look better. I guess that's as good as it's going to get. Uh, domesticated species population management. But uh, anyway, they're you know they they're, within this document. Hopefully, there's going to be. Um, a kernel of, of energy to help us deal with the abandonment problem because that's really the, the crux of the matter. If it were just about population management right now, there'd probably be 20 cats in Brackett's Park. Uh, the more we, you know, we've, we've done a great job on population management of the cats that are there, but abandonment and rehoming, uh, we're just treading water right now. If we can just maintain the number that's there, that's probably a good thing. Why is all this happening? Well, the city went to no-kill. Went to no-kill, what, 2012 when Harburger was there, his last deal, went to no-kill, which I'm certainly not against. I'm proud of San Antonio for, for what that means. However, it doesn't really mean that the cats are going to go find a home. It's a numbers game. Uh, the cats go in, uh, they're ear-tipped, and as this states, as, a, as an alternative to euthanasia, uh, the city can opt to sterilize, vaccinate, and return healthy stray shelter cats to the site of origin or the amount. So, you know, the cats that we have now showing up in Brackenridge Park are all ear tipped for the most part already. So they've come from some shelter someplace, and someone, perhaps a shelter or a uh, colony caretaker in some other area, just is overwhelmed, can't stand it, and uh, the cats end up in Brackenridge. Park. We find them all the time. This is the best that I've been able to get from the city, and I don't blame the city. The city's got plenty to worry about, and this isn't high on their list. But the sign on the on the left was the old sign, and I jumped up and down and wanted a new sign. I wanted it to be more blunt, more explicit about don't abandon, and this is what I got. So next Tuesday, I'm meeting with uh, ACS, and I'm hopeful to get some attention to what comes next. Because if I don't get some help, I'm going to quit doing it. I'm just, it's ridiculous the amount of time and energy that we spend on it. I'm sorry for the cats, but, you know, it's just a, you can't swim upstream. You can't find City Hall. This is an example of uh, over by the zoo lot when the, when the freeze came in and the foliage died back. Somebody had built a, a cat condominium complex over there. And it, what it was, somebody had abandoned animals and the people that abandon animals often, often feel guilty about it, and they will come back and care for these animals, or try to, because we see random feeders all the time. Uh, and this guy, we, we ended up finding out who it was at one point, uh, abandoned some cats there and built this little shelter and came back and fed them every day. Well, of course, the Parks Department hauled that off at some point. He was, you know, he was all up in the arm, you know, but what can you do? Uh, but that's the kind of thing that happens in Brackenridge Park. 
and abandonment happens all the time. I and mean, we've actually caught this young lady abandoning a mama cat and six kittens. Nothing happened to her. Uh, you know, we had the license plate, we had her in it, we did all that kind of stuff, but because we didn't call 311, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you really couldn't prosecute. So, you know, how often this happened? It happens all the time. There was a cat abandoned in Brackenridge Park. I wouldn't surprise me if it was every day. Um, this is what it's like to care for these cats, and especially going and trapping. I mean, I'm the head trapper. I'm one of the best cat trappers ever. And uh, it's interesting. I mean, it's a, it's a challenge to go deep into the park and try and find these cats, especially kittens. And that's what it looks like when you go in there. That's my wife, and those are mosquitoes uh, on her back going in to feed in that park. And that's what I have to wear when I go in uh, deep into the park to go after an animal. I mean, it's a, it is not a hospitable place. So this is a, a good day in the office. That's our, that's our return on investment right there when we can capture all the kittens that we believe are there. So I'm just going to give you an example of what happens to an animal. Someone that's, uh, for example, you know, was thinking that this would be a great thing to do. This cat was ear tipped. Uh, I first saw it in January, January the 30th actually. And it, I knew it had not been there before. I know all the cats. And uh, it was a very attractive animal, so I took, took a picture of it. And then I made a point of taking a picture of it uh, periodically or almost on every feeding trip. And as you can see, that cat has already started to look a little odd. And this is about three months later and uh, didn't look too good. It wasn't getting along. I mean, it was getting along with the cats. It was eating regularly. Uh, and then it, then it showed up like, looking like that. And, I, and this is when... I, you know, I can't stand it. I gotta go trap the cat. And, and you can't imagine how difficult it is to trap one cat out of a colony of, say, 20. That's the cat you wanna go get. I and mean, you can put black traps out all day long and everything, but anyway, I had to get that cat. And I did, and that's a drop trap that, that I have made for us. We have several of them, and that way you can, it's like Elmer Fudd, you prop it up, you got a hinge on it, and you put food in there, you sit there with a string for as long as it takes till the right cat goes in there. You can catch two or three cats in there and ferret them out the door. So anyway, we caught this cat. Uh, we named it Libby. And you never know uh, what you have when you get a cat from the park. You might think it's feral, as I thought this one was. And uh, they're traumatized by that experience, especially if they're social animals. And so we get this cat back, and you know, I'm wearing gloves, and I don't really know what's going to happen. And uh, that's what happened. The cat was just so relieved to be out of that environment in Brackenridge Park. Uh, slept for, I don't know how many days, ate like a horse. We decided to, it, it looked so bad, I mean, its hair was just so terrible, we decided to give it a bath, so we. We gave the cat a bath, and it, it took it pretty darn well. I was really surprised at that. If you've never given a cat a bath, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. So, so this is Libby after her bath, and you can tell how great, how kind of gratified and and, uh, and happy that this cat was to have come out of that park. I mean, it's turned out to be a beautiful animal. Now she started to look back, uh, look like her old self. And we have three foster cages, these large enclosures that we put cats in, volunteers, you know, just to observe them or if they were, you know, coming back from surgery or whatever it may be. Um, you know, we, we, last year, we had 1,113 foster days of cats. Uh, the average stay is 20 days. Uh, the average cost per cat that we have in this situation is $264. Uh, and the Conservancy and, and myself have helped raise this money in grants from the Erie Foundation and also from donations. This cat ended up finding a home, believe it or not. And this lady, I uh, can't remember how she saw it, you know, we post on everything. And she and her husband live in San Marcos. He's a PhD in piano from the University of Texas. They came and got Libby, so Libby hopefully will live happily ever after, not in Brackenridge Park. But for every cat like this that has a happy ending, I've buried a lot of my good friends in that park, dogs, owls, uh, they just finally just give up, can't stand it, can't make it. So um, I would urge you to, if you have any interest at all in helping us, because I can't do this forever. I'm almost 70 with two hip replacements. So somebody else has to pick up the gauntlet and run with it at some point. So the more people we can get 
the better off the cats will be. And as long as we keep doing our job, eventually the cats will be at a minimal population. And those that are there hopefully will at least be healthy. So anyway, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, good luck with your plan, too. <laughs> Yeah, I might just say, Tom's done an amazing job, and uh, we, he has raised about $30,000 from the Area Foundation to help us. And um, we do have a shed now in the park. We have the food, um, and so we do take care of the ear tipping and spaying and neutering and take them back and forth to the vet. So you don't have to buy your own food. But we could use help with feeders, we could use foster, and he can train you how to trap. So, <laughs> call us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, that's all we have, unless anyone has any comments or anything else. Oh, I'm just going to that this is all fixed, and I'm going to time for you to make an announcement. It's really, really quick, because we're at the end. Okay. Hi. Good evening. I'm going to see what's going on in the office, which is Yeah. Just want to let you know that Senator Memphis is having a series of five legislative briefings. Two in your area will include one on the June, this Saturday, June 24th, at the Avenida Guadalupe uh, Progreso Hall, uh, from Saturday, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. These are not political events. These are legislative briefings, open, free and open to the public. The other one will be July 8th, 10 a.m. Uh, to 11.30 a.m. Again, July 8th, the Saturday, at the Via Border. I have flyers that I can share with everyone, including our contact information if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all for coming. And we saw this in your chair. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs>